I remember my mom not ever being around. This is a period when she was drinking again. And so I was having to fend for myself even as a fourth grader. I think in terms of my, my, my defender, my arrogance always came from being good in school and also being able to manipulate adults into getting what I needed. I've always struggled. I've always had to be fighting for something or against something. In middle school, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and the Little Debbie's cakes. And so I remember eating two or three of those a night and hiding the wrappers under my bed. So I'd wake up for, in the middle of the night just to eat. Like the emotions, like as we're replaying, rewinding and playing that clip again in my head, just that those, those feelings and those situations were just helplessness and listlessness. If I were to let all the stuff through, then and people would quick, pretty quickly see that it's all a farce. It's all a fake. I can't let that happen because when you're revealed to be the fake that you are, then you won't be able to shine anymore. You know, I don't want to be made up to be the bad guy here. I'm Emily Eldredge, and this is Dark Light Truth, where we dive into people's darkness, reclaim their light, and reveal their truth. What you're about to hear is a real person going through an actual session of the drawing out process, my seven-step emotional healing technique in which we draw out, talk with, and fully heal an inner part or parts at the core of a person's struggle. In every session, there's a new inner mystery for us to solve, compelling us to investigate who is the inner culprit causing the struggle, why is it there, and how is it trying to protect the person or itself? Once we hear its stories and its truths, we'll heal it, so that rather than hurting the person, it can now help them live their highest, most radiant truth. Every drawing out process session is filled with surprises, epiphanies, twists and turns. We never know what we will encounter, nor who. It all depends on the world that formed within that person in reaction to their life experiences, as well as what their inner wisdom deems is ready to heal once and for all. Listen closely because you never know, hearing someone else heal their darkness just might help you heal yours, too. Join me now for my session with a kind American man named Josh. What you will hear is an edited version of his full two and a half hour session, which he volunteered to record for this podcast. Just so you know, he mentions things like sovereign, free spirit, truth, and guiding light, by which he means guiding star. These are terms from my Change Light system, which you can learn about by joining our free Change Light community and taking the free Change Light system course. But right now, let's listen as he describes the struggles that brought him here today, which we'll soon discover are being caused by a most unlikely character. The thing I want to talk about specifically, the challenge is, is my okay. issues with food. Essentially, I go to food as a as, as solace, like mm -hmm. when I'm scared, when there's fear, when I... Um, uh, also, excitement. Huh. I immediately want to be like, oh, I need to go have some granola. Ah, uh, uh-huh. Um, and so it is, yeah, that's, that's, and so what, how that manifests, of course, is then in incredible weight gain and, and loss. I'm cycles. I've cycled my entire life, up and down and up and down. And then what happens, for example, I'm at, at a bigger phase right now. And so what that then does with my self-confidence with uh, it invokes additional fears uh, because our shame, um, not being able to be in situations or, or take the space that I normally would take um, and use, I think I can be very adept at using my free spirit and 
um, my sovereign mainly to be able to elicit the, the, the change and kind of realize my um, truth. But when, because of, but that, but, but, but this issue with food, I think it is my own self diagnosis is really holding me back. Um, yeah. <clears throat> And what does the food do? I'm just curious, like, what does yep. the food do for you in that moment, whether it's fear Honestly, or excitement? Yeah. Well, it kind of helps. It's, it's in, essentially in order to be fulfilled as a human, I need to be filled as a human. Ah, okay. Um, okay. And so having, you know, either whether it's a, a binging and so, you know, issue where I'm definitely consuming much more than, than I need to, or not even being hungry. Um, but it also puts me in a, in a different state where I can think really clearly when I'm eating. And it's a problem solving methodology akin to being under the shower, right? Um, and that's kind of the go to. Yes, I mean, and trust me, I've tried, oh, well, we'll why don't you go take a walk or go try to take a, little, a run or go do this or go take a shower. And it's, I, I feel for me, it's just when I can get the most clarity, I guess, coming back to that homeostasis from being either excited on one end or the other. Yeah. Um, is it certain kinds of food? Mm. Yeah, I, um, so yes and no. Um, okay. Usually um, starchy with sugar. Um, yeah, cakes and cookies mm -hmm. uh, is is mainly not so much on the candy side. I mm -hmm. mean, if there's nothing else in the house, you know, I will go and get it, or I will have it delivered. So <laughs> there's no. <laughs> yeah. Then, as soon as you put that, let's say, first bite in your mouth, or it might take more than one, what's the feeling in your body? Like, what happens? Yeah, relax. Relax. Exit. Yeah. Yes. Just being able to feel okay again. Like, yeah, like a, uh, like that, yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So either with a frown on my face or a smile on my face, depending on the situation. But it's that's where, okay, this is. Yeah. 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 So it's calming yeah. for you. And when was the first time you remember? <sighs> that happening if if you remember no, a do. first time or a period of yeah. your life yeah go yeah. ahead i can remember first being in probably fourth grade and i remember my mom not ever being around this is a period when she was drinking again um and so i was having to fend for myself even as a fourth grader um and so, for example, for dinner, she would just say, here, here's, here are some food stamps because we were on welfare. So why don't you run to the convenience store and get something to eat? And so then that would happen as I would go to the – or she would say, can you go get me some cigarettes because you could still buy your parents' cigarettes back then. <clears throat> but we didn't have real money. So with food stamps, if you bought something that was a dollar and one cent, you got 99 real cents back. And so if you went to a couple of different convenience stores, you could get the $3 you needed to buy a pack of cigarettes. Oh. Um, so what do you buy? You buy junk and crap. Um, and so I can remember going, yeah, almost every day when I got home from school mm -hmm. and buying lots of, of not great things, um, slushies mm -hmm. and, and ho-hos and, and ding-dongs and, um, snowballs and all kinds of uh, things, lots of candy bars. Mm -hmm. and that's what I consumed when I wasn't in school. Um, mm. Not entirely, but I honestly don't remember other like normal meals that we had. Mm. So, so that um, was your diet as yeah. a child. Yeah. And how did that feel in those moments when you could sort of work that system, if you will? Like, oh, if I use this for this, then I can get this back, and then I can. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, like, how did that? How did that feel when you were doing that? So it's interesting you use the word "work the system." I think that's when I first started to learn to work the system. And then have, 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 have been doing so joyfully in, in whatever system I, I find myself in um, uh, throughout my life. Well, I just think it's a very clever, yeah. and that wasn't meant yeah. ju judgmentally at all. It's funny because no. I even hesitated to use it because I was like, I don't want no. this to sound judgmental. No. But it's like you were really clever as a kid. It was, it was a survival. 
thing. Yeah, um, that, yeah. That working with the system was like, fuck you, I, I, I'll figure it out. You can't stop me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll figure it away. Come hell or high, come hell or high water. Um, yeah. So it felt, yes. I mean, I was, um, I think in terms of my, my, my defender, my arrogance always came from being good in school and also being able to um, kind of manipulate adults into getting what I needed because that was also a coping mechanism. Um, so it felt triumphant that I was able to to do that. And also it was, it, it supplemented um, the care that my mother couldn't provide me. That was the, yeah, the go-to, yeah. I'm also thinking to other periods when I would wake up in the middle of the night. So this is when I was in middle school, I lived with my brother um, because my mom's alcohol um, issues had gotten out of hand where I couldn't live with her anymore. Uh, and so I was living with my brother who was 18 years older than me. Um, and so he had, you know, was married and had three kids. And so, but in middle school, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and, you know, for our lunches, there was the, um, the oatmeal, the little Debbie's cakes. And so I remember eating two or three of those a night and hiding oh. the wrappers under my bed. So I'd wake up for, in the middle of the night just to eat. Yeah. Were there things happening in your life at that time I think, that might have triggered that craving? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a situation I was you know, living with my brother, his, his family. At that point, my mom had come to live with us as well. This is when we moved to Texas to... You know, and I was trying to fit in or find my, my own. I was luckily always good in school, and so I had that, and I was in the clubs, and, and I was a member of my, my brother's church, and so that was, uh, you know, the affirmations that I needed were coming from that too. But I was still always felt as the outsider because it was, you know, me living with my, I'm sure everyone knew my mom's story and what the surrounding situation were, were that. Um, and so just not feeling, always feeling as an outsider. I think there's also um, a point when I was subconsciously maybe coming to my terms with my sexuality. Mm. Um, you know, I never, I, I'm very, very lucky that I never had any issues personally mm-hmm. with, with coming out. But the the people around me, like, you know, this was a, a time when the, when the preacher would talk about those who have HIV uh, AIDS should just be left to die. It would be better for all of us. Oh. Um, yeah. And so I guess there's, you know, some of that woven in there too. Just acceptance, getting affirmations and, and the attention that, 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 that I sought or didn't have for so many years. Wow. So, yeah, a lot going on. Mm-hmm. But it was also figuring out how to man- manipulate the system because, um, for example, for Wednesday night services, the um, the church organist um, would, would pick me up and take me. And, and I would, you know, in the youth group, figure out how to play the piano. And she saw that I figured out how to play the piano. So then after that, she started giving me uh, private lessons for free. Oh. Uh, and so those were like things where I didn't have it, of course. And she also, she bought me a, a keyboard. Um, and then for my recital, she brought me clothes. And so that was kind of, um, figuring out what, however way I could to manipulate the system again, to get what I needed. Well, that's what you needed to, to do to survive. Sure. Sure. And prior to that, what was life like? So life was, mm, we had by that point. I think I had moved. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, or six times. But it wasn't like it wasn't. My mom wasn't drinking then, oh. so she had a job. Um, and I think where her down point fell um, started was when I was six or seven. My grandma died. It was her rock. Oh. And so that's what, yeah. And then she had a, a mortgage on a house, this tiny house we had, looking back, um, and the, the, with a balloon payment. And so she couldn't make the payment anymore. And so 
and we just up and left someplace else. Um, and so it wasn't stable per se, but it wasn't the, um, like, for example, I can't remember us doing activities together, she and I, or I really only remember her sitting um, in the kitchen at the table reading books and smoking cigarettes and drinking Diet Coke, of course. <laughs> So what we've been exploring and identifying so far is Josh's connection, his emotional connection with food. And interestingly, food has an emotional impact on him. It helps him calm down. It even has a mental impact on him. It helps him think more clearly. But also, as you heard in these experiences, these memories that he shared around food, it's also given him a sense of power and control in situations in which he really did didn't have any control, in which his life was filled with a lot of unpredictability and instability. So now that we've identified some of the feelings and the memories and the experiences that have formed this unique relationship he has with food, it's time to start tuning into his body. And as we tune into his body and he starts to write down some of the feelings he's been having, he starts to get an image of something which leads us to discovering a part of him that's been perpetuating this lifelong struggle with food. So as we're talking about this, are you aware of what's going on in your body yeah. and i'm i'm sort of seeking to kind of go into like what are the parts of you or part of parts of you that are carrying the wounds of that time or, mm. or the you know protective or survival or defense mechanisms of that time like what's going on yeah. inside yeah. of you what are you aware of so immediately it's, a, it's my sh- my shoulders oh. are tensed and yeah. my cold english um heckles no those things that get when you're alert, like animals, there. Oh, like your ha- uh, your hackles, hackles, hackles. Yeah, hackles. Yeah, That's okay. a weird one. yeah, 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 yeah. Hackles, like, isn't it with like when the fur stands on end or something? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. I feel, and then so I, I, as we've been talking, I've had to notice really like relax, breathe out, lower my shoulders. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah I think. Is it fear? I don't know if I can, if, if I, if there's a word, because of course, logically in my brain, I don't feel afraid. Yeah, yeah. But my body is reacting like this because there's something to be on guard for. In terms of being on guard, is it, does it, that almost feel like a reaction to the emotions coming up? I think so. And I say that because. Like the emotions, like as we're replaying, rewinding and playing that clip again in my head, mm-hmm. just that those, those feelings, mm-hmm. those situations with just helplessness and blisslessness. Helplessness and, and blisslessness, yes. Just the reaction to, oh, what do I do in those situations? Yes. So I know what I did in those situations and how I worked the system to, to eventually get out, but... In the moment, yeah, it's real. Yeah. Can you, do you have your paper and crayons or whatever you've got in front of you? Yeah, do you have I that do. with you? Okay. Yeah. If you would, let's start writing down some of the words you've said. You said helplessness and listlessness. Yeah. If this feels true for you, you've, some of the other words you've used, the, the feeling words have been like fear. Um, Mm -hmm. shame I don't know if that resonates that was a word you used earlier Mm -hmm. yeah on guard Uh, invisible invisible yes Uh, unwanted unwanted yeah Um, muted. 
Muted. What's the muted? Mm. So all of this issues with food as a result of all the stuff in the past really puts a metal cover on my potential. So this, so that, that, it's that p- potential that's muted. Tamp down. Yeah. So it's because it's a metal cover, you can't hear on the other side of it. Or you can hear faintly, but you can't hear it. Okay. okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't resonate with the, its full potential resonance. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Are you getting an image of that metal cover? Is that, yeah. you mm-hmm. that? go ahead and, and draw that and whatever else comes to mind. This is beautiful. You're doing great. Okay. Okay. What you got there? Yeah. It's a black great type thing, like a manhole covering. Underneath there's vibrant colors that are striving to get out. You can't register rejected. And is it like, is it like an actual, as though it's sort of a roadway or it's sort of a surface and there's a cover in it and then underneath are the colors or is it like a container? Um, yeah, so it's actually just free, it's free floating. Oh. There's nothing else around it. There's not, it's on top of a road. It's great there. So there's like, um, like hatch marks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh The gradient is like a hatch mark gradient. But is, is it, um, are there holes in it or no? No, there are no holes. No holes. Okay. And the colors underneath, Mm -hmm. um, it's just sort of like colors, kind of amorphous, like what? Yeah. So it's lines um, going to the, the, going to reach the, the surface. Uh-huh. But then they go back down. The, so it's blue, red, yellow, green, orange. Does it feel like the cover is trying to hold them in? Like, it does it have a sort of a, an intention to do that? Is it trying to mm, do that? No. No. It is. It's simply there. Uh-huh. Right? So in the, in the existing system. <laughs> And it's also, it's not budging. What's its name? The cover? Harry. <laughs> Harry. Harry. Oh, Harry. Oh, <laughs> that's great. As in like H-A-R-R-Y? Yep. Uh, where did that come from? Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. That's no, great. I love it. Harry. And is it like Harry the manhole, the manhole cover? Or? Harry the manhole cover. Mary the man all cover. I love it. That's excellent. Okay. And those colors. Is there a name for the colors? I mean, um, straight into potential hope. Yeah. Catalyst. Okay. All of those. Ad- they're all named adjectives of things yeah. to help. Yeah. Oh, nice. Change. Okay. Okay, so what Harry represents? Is yes, Harry is the um, not just the f- the food or the need for food, uh-huh. and, and what it, that actually does physically and metaphysically to to my body, and then the ensuing um, emotional distress that comes from from, from that and the uncomfortableness. Oh. It's also right, so it's it's all of that. Not letting the colors through, not letting the, the potential and, you know, my truth guiding light um, through. But also Harry represents like this hesitancy or reticence oh, uh-huh. in allowing the colors to shine. So it's yes. both, it's like double or triple or quadruple entendre. Mm-hmm. Kind of like weighs you down mm-hmm. is that is that what i'm hearing so physically weighing down it also okay. leads to weight gain which then leads to 
you know, not fitting into clothes and then always being cognizant of that when I walk into a room or I get on an airplane or I'm, I'm in a meeting, always thinking, oh, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to think of me? It wants to hold, Harry wants to hold me back. Because it, subconsciously, Harry thinks I'm more comfortable being heavy and not, you know, reaching that potential, taking the space that I need to take. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. So he's doing, he's doing a lot here, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Well, is it okay if I have a conversation with Harry? Sure. I then invite Harry to speak, which he agrees to do. Josh is awake and aware through our whole conversation. Hey, hi. It's nice to talk to you. Mm-hmm. So I hear that, I mean, I just know a little bit about you so far. You're, you're just like sitting there, kind of a heavy, like metal cover. Like, what, what are you up to? What are you doing? I'm you know, keeping things in line. Keeping, keeping things it... in order. Yeah, uh... making sure that this all works the way it's supposed to work. You know, we got to make sure we don't get too crazy here. Make sure that people are you know, where they need to be. And so there's a, a lot of you know people and things that want to come through and pass by me, but you know, I need to make sure that um, you know things don't get out of hand. So what's an example, Harry, of like things getting out of hand? Let's say, what would you consider? Like, oh, this is too out of hand. Well, I think what, um, you know, letting people, whether it's Joshua or other people, um, you know, out there showing all their colors and all the things that they think are important there. Well, as Joshua says, fabulousness. Mm, mm -hmm. Because, you know, what happens is that people, you know, if I let, if I were to let all the stuff through, then. And people would quick, pretty quickly see that it's all a farce. It's all a fake. And uh, I can't let that happen because that hurts people. Yeah. Because when you're revealed to be the fake that you are, then you won't be able to shine anymore. So it's better to keep people you know, at that medium level. Keep going on. Keep doing the thing. That's what's important. Uh huh. When you say it's a farce, it's a fake. You mean that this like so-called fabulousness isn't real? Yeah. Well, contrived. Yeah. It's just part of the you know the system of manipulation for oh. you know self-aggrandizement for um you know an, an illicit supply of dopamine and bits and feeling special. You know that's why I'm really grateful for TikTok and Instagram Reels so people can get their hits there and not try to. You know, go out and be revealed there. Oh. And when you say people, do you mean Joshua? Or I mean, that's, you know, currently, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a pretty big, um, uh, great, as you can tell, you know, I'm, I'm of importance. And so I'm not only covering Joshua, but I'm sure there's lots of people I'm, I'm covering. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I see. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So you're not just covering Joshua. You're sort of covering a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And trying to keep others from seeing that actually what others think is fabulous about them is not really, yeah. not really fabulous. It's just fake. We well, just want to, you want to make sure that people don't see that, that, that like Joshua and other people are just fake. False. Well, yeah, because what happens is then they get hurt. Because then yeah. they get hurt. And they go yeah. back to those original, you know, the sources of, you know, of pain. Because, you know, everyone's just an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just a tiny ant. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you know, they're not going to be able themselves to move mountains. You know, mm-hmm. but like, all this aggrandizement, whether it be, you know, Joshua's case, he was always told as a child that he was amazing, he was going to change the world, and he was something special. He believed, you know, he believed it. 
Mm. Um, and so what happens is that you believe that, you believe that, you believe that. Well, there's no foundation there. Uh, and so, you know, if people get to the point where, you know, he is up there, you know, making things, doing things, whatever the system stuff he talks about, that then people say, well, where the hell is he from? You know, he grew up, you know, this, that, that, and other. He didn't, he didn't grow up with no father. He didn't da 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 da. Mm-hmm. And so that's going to hurt him. They'd start to poke holes in that yep. fabulous facade that he has. Indeed. Indeed. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and see that it's all just an illusion. Yep. Yeah. They judge him, they ridicule him, they ask him the questions of well, who are you supposed to be here? And sure, he has some trite answer. Com- composed, comprised. He probably used Chat GPT to put it together. And that, that'll fool some people initially, but you know, no. Yeah, and then, and then, if when that happens, that would really hurt. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. better, so you know, to keep him at a mid level. You know, uh-huh. point where he feels like he's doing something. Feels mm-hmm. like he's, you know, changing the systems, whatever, at that level. But yeah, going big is not going to be because then he'll just crash down. He's a further to fall. He has much further to fall if I let him go higher. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean that makes sense, right? The higher you go, yeah. the farther yeah. you have to fall. Yeah, yeah. So your job is to make sure he does not, he doesn't get mm-hmm. too high. Like right. maybe a little bit, you know. Sure, yeah. bring him back down a little bit. Yeah. Bring him back down. Yep. Well, and I, I, what I'm hearing too is that you're you're really concerned about Joshua feeling hurt. Yeah. You really don't want him to feel hurt. Yeah, because yeah. I don't want so, him to feel that he's not loved enough, or that he doesn't have enough, or he doesn't belong enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, so. It's interesting, Harry, because those sound a lot like how he felt when he was a kiddo. Mm-hmm. So those are those are very familiar feelings for him, aren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we can't let that happen again. Can't let that happen again. And that's your job, Harry. You're like no. not going to let that happen again. No, no. So I, I, I have a full deploy, a full range of techniques and technologies to make uh-huh. sure that we keep him in case. So sure, there's the food thing. You know, he's been 300 pounds. He's also been 160 pounds. And so making sure, you know, last time he was really felt, um, uh, you know, made sure. I brought on this thing called COVID to give him a lot of stress so he could eat some more so he could get back up because he was starting to, to push the boundaries. Oh. And, and it worked. So he gained a lot of weight back. And, and now, you yeah, know, keep him, keeping him in line so he doesn't feel too proud or too arrogant or too, you know, these other things. Or away. too good. Yeah. Just generally good about himself. Yeah. Well, it's just, you know, he has, if you look in the, the meta view, mm-hmm. and there's little blips, you know, blips are the feeling good and you know, feel bad. We all, everybody goes through that. So let's, you know, maintain those in a certain range, you know, mm-hmm. so that they average out on average. And mm-hmm. that's the goal. You know, that's, that's my, my, um, my, uh, my mandate here. And so ah. we don't want him on, on average to feel much better because, again, the, the chances of him falling and hurting are much more. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, so you kind of calibrate that. Yeah. So Harry is what I call an inner controller. Controllers are one of the three types of inner struggles that I've identified through the drawing out process. And their MO is just as their name states. They are trying to control us or another part of us. But ultimately their intentions are good. As you heard with Harry, he's trying to protect Josh from the feelings that he had as a little child. He wants Josh to feel loved. He doesn't want him to feel unsafe or out of control or insecure. As we're about to find out, though, there's an even bigger role that Harry has been playing for Josh. He formed at a time to fill a particular void in Josh's life. Tell me, Harry, how did it feel for you? I mean, let me just ask you this. Like, when was the first time you remember 
feeling like you needed to do this job that you're doing? No, no. Let me think. Let me see, was Joshua no? Hmm. I think he was, I remember watching him as he was coming up in school, kindergarten, mm -hmm. first grade, you know, getting into special classes, these honors classes, um, when he mm -hmm. was just a, a, a little boy. And that didn't really mm. fit, like, with the, um, you know, the pedigree that he was born into. And so, mm. you know, as, as things went south on in the family life, you know, when he moved into the, the, the duplex or the quadplex, mm -hmm. um, into the tiny house, then, you know, I saw, you know, he, I'm sure he was struggling, but I wanted to make sure that I could get him used to or accustomed to me, um, you know, controlling the, the ups and the downs. Yeah. And so this is maybe, you know, third, fourth grade around there. Because, you know, as a child, he didn't, he didn't know right from wrong and about needing to limit yourself in terms of what's possible. So, you know, he did the church thing. He did the piano thing. He did all the instruments, um, all the school stuff, won competitions, you know, up through middle school and high school, despite, you know, all the high schools he went to. Um, you know, he was just trying to survive. You know, as he grew up, he, you know, started to, luckily through my help, was able to kind of regulate that and, mm. and maintain some humility. Mm. Maintain some humility. Because, yeah, some of his peers that he went to university with, for example, you know, they came from more average uh, backgrounds that, you know, that certainly, you know, of course, he never talked about because he was so ashamed of his background. But it was, um, you know, that's when he first started to realize, wait, uh, he was much different. Mm. In terms of how he grew up and how he had to, you know, what he had to do to survive. Yeah, yeah. Why is humility so important to you, yeah. Harry? Just curious. Yeah. yeah, you know, you see, and he's seen this too, so many people who come from a different background mm -hmm. and haven't had to have the hard knocks, knocks then and, and get back up as many times as, as he has to. And, mm. and they have no consideration, no consideration whatsoever mm. for what it takes, you know, whether they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth or, you know, whether, you know, they, because they were of the selected class person, they won the, the, the birth lottery, mm. that they were automatically pushed to the front of the line. Mm -hmm. And that's just the lack of acknowledgement. Now, not, not everybody. He's come across plenty, plenty of people um, mm -hmm. who have the acknowledgement and understanding of that, the, the privilege that they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for those that don't, those are the real, I mean, that, those effectively are the ones who are running this world of shit. Mm. Yeah. Whether it be in government and the philanthropic world and business world, mm -hmm. right? those people who can't take others' views into consideration mm -hmm. or put themselves into their shoes, which, yes, Josh was very good at, but, you know, just that self centeredness is, is mm. what is driving us all apart. Mm. So you don't want him to be like that? No, not at all. No, I mean. Yeah. You don't want him to get too big for his britches. Right. Or else maybe he'd end up like them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And forget where he yeah. came from. And forget where he came from. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, Harry, how did it feel? Well, actually, let me back up. Sorry. 
it was interesting what you said earlier about that you felt like you needed to be sort of you did like regulate him when he was a yeah. kid and it's almost the sense i get is almost like you're an inner parent like he didn't mm-hmm. have usually sure. parents do that for kids right they're the ones who kind of set the boundaries and go whoa that's not okay or nope you need to do it this way or whoa whoa that wasn't very nice you know behavior but it doesn't sound like Joshua had that. No, and it sounds like no. you were aware of that he didn't have that. So you felt like you needed to be that for him. Sure. Is that accurate? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a good way to look at it. Yeah. So you were trying to fill a void yeah. in his life. Yeah. And trying to protect him, too, it sounds like. Yeah. You know, it, it's not just about keeping him down. It's also bringing him up when he needs it. Oh. How do you bring him yeah. up when he needs yeah. it? So making sure that he's, you know, you know, whether it be he needs the the candy or the food, um, you know, continuing, you know, when he's when Josh was flat out, you know, trying to con- you know continue to say, you know, you you can you can do this. Mm. You, you know, there's no need to give up. You've always done it before. It's always worked out. Mm. Yeah. You know, as his as his mom used to say. Always, um, don't sweat the small shit, and it's all small shit. So, how did you discover that food worked for him to help oh, him feel better? Yeah, well, because when he didn't have any place else to turn, he didn't have an adult to turn to. Of course, kids of age had no idea what to do, what was happening. You know, he uh-huh. had a few teachers in school who could help out, but you know, they're not able to be there day in and day day out. Um, so I found pretty quickly that, you know, food, not only sure got some, had his, his belly full, um, but it made him, you know, in, enjoy life a little bit when it was hard. Mm, yeah. And it sounds like it was hard a lot. Yeah. And I was, I'm curious about that too, Harry. How did it feel for you to see Joshua in pain? Yeah. You know, everybody has pain. It's part of life. And it's just, unfortunately, it's part of it. I think some of us, we are just born in, in places where it was going to be more painful. Um, and a lot of people don't get through it. But I think Josh was strong. He got through it. He persevered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, it can't have felt good to see him in pain. Oh, no. I mean, you know, the fact that you want to protect him from pain, from feeling mm-hmm. that pain again, tells me that it was hurt. It hurt you too. You know, it was yeah. hard to see him. Yeah. yeah, but it made him stronger. Oh. Yeah. Oh. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what one of the things I love about Joshua is that he really has taken his struggles and and turns it into wisdom, you know, and the work that he's doing and the impact that he has, you know, it's definitely made him strong in some ways. It's just at the same time, it sounds like a lot of this tamping down is, Mm -hmm. you know, might be actually making him feel weaker in some ways. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he'll get there. He's, he's, um, I don't want to say he's a rabid dog, but he's he's not going to give up. So there's no worry about that. Mm. It's just you know make sure that you know it's none of the, no, nobody no, nobody gets a free lunch, um, mm. and so he has to you know and he has to prove himself more mm. you know, on all the different areas. Mm. Yeah, and so that's just sure he'll, he'll come out stronger at the end, and maybe he can make a a bit better impact if that's what he's wanting to do or. Whatever it is, I don't quite understand it. Uh... You may have noticed some reticence in my voice, some hesitancy to agree with Harry on this point. That's because that what Harry is saying is actually a pretty common statement in reaction to trauma. A lot of times when we don't really want to deal with our feelings and the real pain that we experience during struggles in our lives, sometimes we can say, well, it made me stronger. Well, you know, it really actually, it's fueled my success. 
And while this may be true, ultimately denying those feelings can really be very harmful. So just in case you were hearing that in my voice, that's what was going on with me. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't actually say it in the moment. But here's the interesting thing. We'll hear later on in the session essentially where those messages came from and whose voice that is. Do you think it helps him feel stronger to tamp down on his light? No, no, I don't, no, not at all. No, of course nobody likes it, but I'm worried if I weren't here and if that light shone through, mm-hmm. right, then again, he would just both well, forget where he came from, forget what he had to endure mm-hmm. to get to where he got, mm-hmm. right, and then realize that there's no material foundation, right, to what he has. Mm. Right. Look, look, all mm. almost all the jobs he had, he walked in there not knowing a damn thing about the subject that he got hired for. Oh. Yeah. So. Wow. He figured it out, sure. He's pretty good at that internet thing. Mm-hmm. He can talk to people, he can put things together, he can see patterns that other people can't see. That's great. But, you know, once you get a certain level, you got to be careful. Let me ask you this, Harry. Do you want to keep doing this job forever? I mean, I know I hear that you're concerned about what would happen if you didn't do this job, but like, uh, do you really want to keep doing this forever? Well, it's just what I know, what I've been doing for you know, 35 years, 35 plus years. Mm-hmm. Really? You know, I have to say, also because of me, Joshua's been able to get ahead and do some things that most people wouldn't have been able to do take uh-huh. some risks you know so it's not all oh, you know i don't want to be made up to be the bad guy here uh-huh yeah oh no i hear you i hear you and you know i hear that you're you really care about him honestly yeah, sure. i mean why else wouldn't you why else would you want to protect him yeah. you saw when he was a little kiddo that he needed someone looking out for him yeah. and it sounds to me like you really took that you took on that job and you watched him grow and you you've adjusted your techniques and you know and you you yeah you keep him down but you also try to help him feel better like mm-hmm. i mean i'm hearing you're doing a lot sure. and i am hearing i appreciate that you said that harry because yeah i mean you you've probably been sort of the behind the scenes you know secret to some of his some of his success sure yeah yeah sure. and i think you should be acknowledged for that yeah absolutely and i don't want you to think i think you're not at all the bad guy i'm yeah. just sort of you know curious about like if this is really the job you want to keep doing or if it's what you know joshua needs at this point mm-hmm. you know since mm-hmm. he's not a kiddo anymore sure, sure. um I, I do have another question for you how do you want joshua to feel well i I think this is something I've been working on is you know, over his life is to help him feel secure. Uh-huh. Yeah, secure in what he's doing. You know, he has all the confidence in the world that it's uh, it's all gonna work. Mm-hmm. But just that he maintains you know, that that the humanness of him. You know, his charming uh... Right, that humanness that you know, you know, he likes to think in the in, in his head, have his heads in the head in the clouds a lot yeah. in terms of changing this and changing that and putting different things together that haven't been done before. How do we mm-hmm. keep his feet on the ground and so feel mm. you know, yeah, kind of yeah, keep his yeah, yeah. tested, yeah, okay, yeah. And I have another question for you. What do you like about Joshua? Well, he's a good fella. No, he's kind, empathic. Mm -hmm. He's brilliant. He's a survivor. He's a great man. Mm. I can see why you'd work so hard to protect him. Make sure he stays a good human being. At this point, Harry says that he's done sharing. So we go back to talking to Joshua. So, 
And what stood out about that conversation for you? Yeah. So I think a lot of that was, um, I'm laughing because I don't, I got my Texas draw back. <laughs> because it's, that's how my mom talks. It's exactly like the phraseology she used. And I, I, I realized that like halfway through the conversation, um, I was like, well, I'm too far in now. No, but that's exactly wow. Right. Like all of those things, like keeping down, make sure you keep humble. You know, if you figure it out, you know, if you don't, if you don't kill you, it makes you stronger. That's, that's her through and through hundred percent. How did that feel then? Did you realize <laughs> it felt how nice. Much? It felt good. It's like I was kind of like being hooked. It's like good to see my mama again. She's been oh. gone. She's been dead for fifteen years. What am I? Yeah, fifteen. Yeah. yeah. But it felt like there was some reconnection with her yeah. there. Sure, sure. Oh, that's wow. Did you just say it felt like being hugged? Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, what else? Mm. <laughs> okay. So, you know, just my, my, my way is, okay, great. We've I, I identified, acknowledged it. Now, let's get it out of here. <laughs> okay. Is that how you're feeling right now? <laughs> like, yeah, come on. Let's, okay, yeah. 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 No, no, no. That's good. No, Don't worry. Before we're we're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> that's my initial. But I sure wouldn't be thinking to process it. That's, yeah. Thinking about. Holding that. Yeah, we'll get there. It's okay to sit yeah, yeah, yeah. and let it process right now, but we will yeah. get there. I promise. Yeah. yeah. There I, I feel it's some. Yeah, it's multifaceted, right? Because yes, it's the food. Yes, it's holding back. Yes, it's putting a cover on, allowing me to, you know, get to where I think I need to go. To go. Uh -huh. But there's uh -huh. also this, and I mentioned it a bit briefly in the conversation with Harry that. I feel like I've been conditioned my entire life to be great, to do great. And so that's always something that I haven't really spoken. I don't know if I've spoken or really looked at that specifically, but it's just this expectation from everyone around me, from my, my siblings, from always growing up that, oh, well, Joshua's going to change the world. Oh. Yeah. How did it feel for you to get those messages growing up or even as an adult? And at the same time, how did it feel for Harry to bring that up? Yeah, yeah. So for me as a kid, it was just, that was an acknowledgement of my strengths, of mm -hmm. my individuality, of my uniqueness. I think for Harry, it, it was frankly baseless. You oh. know, coming from where I, where I grew up and how the people in my family, how they grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, so effectively, oh. I guess what they were saying is you are not going to stay here and be one of us. Um, oh, interesting. Right? right, right. And so it's not necessarily you know, all this, you know, again, the haves and haves nots, but just, I'm, you know, as how was Harry thinking about that or my mom thinking about that, you're going to change the world, is that that's the only thing they knew how to say. When they knew that I, you know, I wasn't part of that. Ah, uh, yeah. Or I wasn't meant to be in that uh, clique or that class, you know. Interesting. Or whatever that means. Yeah. 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 Hmm. So what does Harry look like now? Has he changed at all? I think he's, he's in the corner looking back. Oh, in yeah. the corner. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's looking, looking, just observing, just seeing, okay, what happens next? What's hmm. making this not, not quite decided how he's okay. going to manifest the next, whatever that is. He's manifesting. Okay. Can you draw him how he looks now? I'd love to. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> what would you got there? Yeah. So I see him now as not just a flat, before he was more two dimensional. Yes, he was three dimensional because he had. Uh, a little little girth to him. Um, but now mm -hmm. I see him more as in a three-dimensional realm where he's more a bit of a blob, still a metal thing, but he's now more porous. Mm. Okay. Yeah, where, and I kind of see his, 
maybe standing up one of the walls he's standing up against is, is, is glass, and so the light can then reflect back out a bit more brightly, maybe? Because I feel like he's in the corner, like, trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next? Like, nah. And um, does he have a face? No, no, he doesn't. He's a blob. He's a blob. <laughs> he's a blob. <laughs> he has okay. to be, like, I guess just waiting to see. I don't think see. he wants to necessarily leave. He's not ready to retire. Yeah. Right? Because he also feels, takes ownership or responsibility uh. or, yeah, ownership is right. Yeah, for the good and the bad along the way. Uh. Yeah. Okay. And so he's not you know, ready to forego completely. Okay. But I think he's trying to figure out what that next metamorphosis this is. Okay. Well, he doesn't have to figure it out on his own. Just letting you know, yeah. letting you know that it's okay. We'll figure it out together if if he's open to that. Um, and how are you feeling about him? Yeah, I, I feel I feel warm. Oh. Yeah, because again, it was you know, my mom and some of the realizations, like around you know, holding back. Oh, yeah. The holding back part, like the putting a, a damper because of the fear of failure, because of the fear of, of course, the imposter syndrome and everything that comes with that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Do you see how he's been trying to protect you, whatever ways he knew up to now? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you see his good intentions for you. I do. I then guide Josh through a short script that helps Harry feel valued and appreciated for what he's been trying to do for him. Here's how Harry responded. How does he feel hearing that? How do we respond to that? He feels seen. He feels understood. Yeah, and appreciated. Good. Good. Has he changed at all? Just curious. No, I think he's still a blob. Okay. Just curious. With holes. Just like to check in. Yeah. With holes. <laughs> a holy a blob. blob. A holy blob. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I then guide Joshua through a short script that helps Harry know that he no longer needs to feel, think, or behave that way, that it's okay to let it go. Here's how Harry responded. How did he respond to that? No, I think he gets it. He understands Mm. that. Good, good, good. Do you feel like giving him a hug? Yeah. Or even receiving Certainly. one from him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and do that? How does that feel? Good. Feels good. good. For sure. Good, good, good. I then guide Joshua through another step so that Harry can realign with Joshua's desires and truth. So I want to feel full of energy and light and buoyancy and effervescence and abundance and all these great adjectives um, and determination and uh, cunning and quick but grounded. I want to feel in harmony with life and family and work and pleasure and all the things. Nice. I think essentially I'm a joyful agitator. Oh, interesting. I like that. (laughs) And so given my lived experience with systems and getting around them and through them and all the good stuff, I want to be, you know, that presence Of where I both am able to 
quickly identify holes to heal systems or to change systems to be more healthy for, for, for all. Um, mm. But also not be afraid, going back to what Harry was doing, of taking up that space that I need. Yeah. And not feeling yeah. shame for being as big as I need to be. And using that as a, um, a continuing multiplier. Ooh, yeah. yeah. I have this image of, of being a, a blue lobster in a, in a small um, aquarium. Uh-huh. You know, one that sure is possible to grow as big as you, you can imagine. Mm-hmm. But it can only, I can only you know, molt to mm-hmm. fit inside of my aquarium. So it's about mm-hmm. being comfortable with building myself a bigger aquarium. <gasps> Interesting. Okay. Is this a positive image for you then? Yeah. Does oh. this feel good? Is this like, yeah, I am the blue lobster? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Go yeah. for it. So it's not that I'm feeling trapped. It's, I guess it's just the, the metaphorical cage or glass that an aquarium has so being able to i guess to be comfortable and living in the ocean where things are unfettered abounded yeah so being a blue lobster almost like let me see if i understand this correctly you've been a blue lobster like in an aquarium yeah in a tiny aquarium in a tiny aquarium but now it's like i want to be the blue lobster in the big great big sea yeah and feel comfortable with that yeah what is Harry, how does he feel he could support you in that? Mm. You know, I think what Harry feels like he's doing is taking off one of the sides of the aquarium. Oh. Right? And so yeah, will still be there and maintain that aquarium in all of its glory. So when, when I need to come back, you know, and visit... You know, the, my, my roots always be there. Nice. And how does that feel for you? Yeah, it feels, it feels um, grounded, homely. Oh. Right? Of having that spot. Yeah. That's needed. All right. So what you got there? Yeah, so I see a, a lobster coming out of this purple tank with purple walls. So it's still grass and and some things in it. Uh huh. And then just going off into the wide yonder. And how does that feel for you? It feels nice. Good. And I just want to check, so I realize I didn't ask. Harry's definitely done with his old job, correct? Yeah, Harry's done with his old job. Comple- okay, just want to make yeah. sure. I realize I forgot to ask. That's always, yeah. I want to make sure. He's completely done with his old job. He is helping to maintain this aquarium yeah. where the blue lobster used to be, but it considers home, right? Yeah. It's comfortable and safe. But he's letting you, the blue lobster, or he's, you know, he's there to maintain it while you get to be out in the great big sea. Yeah. And it feels good for you. Yeah. Because it gives Harry purpose. No, I love it. It's almost like, like they say, keep the home fires burning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like he's sort of keeping the home fires burning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What a sweetie he is. Sounds like he really loves you. Yeah. So at this point, 
Harry is complete. His transformation is total. He is done with his old job. He is ready to be here to support Joshua in living his truth and shining his brightest light, as opposed to pushing that light down, which is what he was doing before. But listen to what happens next as we hear Joshua struggling with this new reality, with the possibility that he could actually be free of this inner struggle. When you, I've been in the cycle for so long about, well, like this mental mind game about, well, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. Like essentially arguing with Harry. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes, most of the time Harry wins, sometimes he doesn't, but oftentimes there'll be periods where he doesn't win and he still figures out how to you know, do what he needs to do. Mm-hmm. And so it's just about, but like, I guess it's that trusting of th- that subconscious stuff isn't coming yeah. to the fore or won't come to the fore or... You know, the fear that, oh, well, no, I think you've, there's only a 7,986 thing that you've tried. Right? Uh-huh. That's, I guess there's some, some worry or some trepidation in my, I'm feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, how can I trust he's not going to go back to doing that? No. Um, and also, it's been such a constant struggle for so long. No. It can be hard to believe that, oh, maybe things could be different. And also, even on some level, who am I without this struggle? Yeah, I mean, because my entire um, like playbook Uh, of who I am, where I've gotten, how I've been here, is because of the struggle of overcoming all this. Yeah. And so it's like, well, what are you struggling with? (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah so imagine if there wasn't a struggle Oof. yeah what's the hoof what's going on there <laughs> just that like sense of relief like oh if you didn't actually have to you know if you didn't use so much energy on this and you were able to free that up to just let that energy do something else wow yes yes so just for fun, let's, do you want to play with that? Sure. Like, wow, yeah. all this energy that up to now has been caught up in struggle. Yeah. I mean, it can be overwhelming of like, oh my God, what the, f- <laughs> yeah. <sighs> what, you know, like almost a little overwhelming, like, oh, that's kind of, what do I do with that? But mm-hmm. also like, wow, what can I do with that? Sure. What if it were also that you could actually feel comfortable in your own skin? Yeah. Too? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there have only been very few times where I've actually felt that. And the thought of actually feeling that way, what happens for you when you actually consider that as a possibility? Yeah. You could actually feel that. Well, because you're not sure. Because I don't know, because it's a different identity, because I've always struggled. I've always had to be f- yeah. fighting f- for something or against something. I don't know. It's a different, yeah, like I said, it's a different, different um, identity. So having to become comfortable with that identity. Yeah, yeah. And realizing that you are not your struggle. Yeah. And you never were your struggle. You're just very identified with it. And it has served you. I mean, as he even said, Harry, he's like, well, but let me ask you this. So in terms of, your own truth mm-hmm. what do you who do you feel you're here to be what do you feel yeah. is your truth yeah. um so it's a melange of of, of, of words and concepts so mm-hmm. so i'm here in this life to catalyze revolutionary systemic healing and betterment being the first or the second domino in a complicated mural of dominoes that when fall result in humans being able to be more okay with themselves, 
with each other, with their communities, organizations, and with Earth. So what if your life up to now and the struggles you've had mm -hmm. have prepared you for living this truth? Yeah. <clears throat> and as they've prepared you, you know, made you stronger, given you insights, kind of forced you to develop aspects of you that without those struggles may not have developed sure. as fully. So now that you're you've had the, the weight training, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it serve your truth to keep carrying those struggles with you while you're trying to affect that truth? Mm, no. Right. Not at yeah. all, because those it's, are all precedents that were required yes. to this. Yes. Yes. But they don't need to be active conflagrants. Hmm. but rather states of, of existence of the past. Well, and Harry kept saying, I don't want him to forget where he comes from. Yeah. So I don't see you forgetting no. where you co you've come from or what you've been through. But just because we, like we can, we can remember something without carrying that emotional charge from it. Oh. Yeah. Right. We can remember something without being burdened by the trauma of it, we can take yeah. those lessons and release the emotional stuff that is draining. It can make us more triggered. Mm -hmm. it, it can prevent us from seeing things as clearly because we're then seeing it through the lens of that trauma as opposed to seeing from a place of wisdom having been through that, but like fully present in the moment now. Yeah. So like I see it as like you have been through a kind of hell, you know, like boot camp mm -hmm. to enable you to be ever more strong and powerful and incredible and empathic and real yeah. so that you can bring all of that to more to living this truth that you're here to live. Yeah. It's just by way of saying that we can become kind of attached to our struggles and even a little bit addicted too, especially right. if you're not used to it, <laughs> right? Like not it's used really to not time. being in struggle, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you think in terms of, well, does that work? Like, does it, is it really working for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, my story might be working for me in terms of sharing why I'm passionate about what I do and how I help people. It doesn't mean I have to carry all the emotional charge and yeah. weight and burden of it yeah it's funny it's okay to be okay <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to not be okay and it's okay that's to right. be okay <laughs> that's right yeah anything else coming up for you like a few more things i want to draw oh good yeah 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 and um yeah bring in so I'm drawing this idea of the temporality of struggling. That's not, yeah. So that's an important building block, but it's not the current that runs through. Yeah. Very oh good. Nice, nice, uh, nice. Good. What'd you draw? I drew um, um, bricks, struggle bricks that were on top of each other. So to represent that. This a thing. It doesn't move. It's um like it's part of a foundation or whatever mm -hmm. needs to be built. And how are you feeling? I feel good. Okay. I feel in harmony. I feel balanced. Intrigued to see what happens next. Well, the good thing is you got Harry there helping you, really keeping the home fires burning for you, helping you have a safe haven to come to. He's always there for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for hugs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly.
I caught up with Joshua a few weeks after our session to find out how he'd been feeling and what changes he'd noticed. He said the overarching feeling had been of self-acceptance, that every time he passes a mirror, he's not like, ah. He said he'd been going to events and not giving a shit what people think about him. And that any time a self-critical thought would come up, he'd think, eh, there's nothing I can do to satiate you. And the thought would go away. He said, with the food stuff specifically, I used to think I need the comfort of food. But now I can decide, do I need this? He said, I don't always make the right choice. But at least now there's a space for that choice to be made. Ultimately, I asked Joshua, so are you feeling more relaxed in your own skin? And Joshua said, yeah, I certainly am. And that's what we want, to feel more whole and safe and relaxed in our own skin so that we aren't reacting from our triggers, our pain, our fears, our blocks, our blind spots, so that we're not controlled by our subconscious. So that when we choose to eat this or not eat that, it's our choice, not the choice of some part of us that formed way back when, when we needed it to help us survive. If you'd like to see the drawings from this session, go to darklighttruth.com and scroll down to the drawings section. If you want to learn how to draw out your own inner struggles and strengths, you can take our free 45-minute course in our free Change Light community. Simply go to community.changelight.world, where you can also discuss episodes of Dark Light Truth in a safe, supportive space and get my insights about them. If you are interested in going through the drawing out process privately with me over the phone or in person, go to changelight.world forward slash coaching. If you'd like to apply to go through the drawing out process for this podcast, please apply at changelight.world forward slash apply. If you enjoy Dark Light Truth, please post a review and share an episode with your family and friends. This raises our ratings and enables us to help even more people. Dark Light Truth was recorded on Riverside.fm and edited with GarageBand. The music is from Tribe of Noise and Soundstripe. I especially want to thank my parents, Susan and Link Eldridge, and my husband, Paco Torres, all of whom have been incredibly loving, patient, and wise mentors for me in my work. The drawing out process is not therapy, and I am not a licensed therapist. I developed this work myself, and I am its exclusive owner and guide. Whether you are a seeker or practitioner, please respect that this is my proprietary work and it must be properly led in order for it to be fully effective. Do not try to do this process on your own. Thanks. It's great that they used to call me Little Monet. Not. A little what? Monet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was sarcasm? Yes, it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>